welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Nikki Barua, your host for today's episode. Have you ever wondered why some organizations come up with game-changing ideas while others struggle? What can you as a leader do to ignite creativity and spur innovation? And what does it really take to push for change and stand up for what you believe in? Our guest is award-winning leader and chief marketing officer, Leanne Daly, who shares how to build great teams and let good work happen. Throughout her career, Leanne has been a pioneer who's not afraid to break rules or take risks. She's a passionate advocate for bold new ideas that excite people and keep brands relevant. Leanne has been a C-suite leader at public and private companies since 1998, including being CMO at ESPN, Thomson Reuters, and Game Show Network. Leanne has won wide industry recognition from con lines to being top female sports business executive named by Sports Business Journal. Leanne is also an investor and advisor to early stage companies and the board director of the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation and the Dean's Advisory Board at IU's Media School. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you. This is going to be a super fun conversation because you are someone with such a diverse set of interests with uh, so many different skills and experiences, truly a Renaissance woman. I'm going to start with that. Like, What drives you? Wow. I would say curiosity. I'm, I'm a person who is a little bit of a like a culture omnivore and uh, interested in technology, interested in nature. Like, so all three of those things drive my sort of drive me forward into wanting to understand, you know, what's new, what's been discovered, you know, how, how are certain technologies being used or, or, you know, what have we learned about uh, biomimicry, you know, like all different kinds, it all sort of braids together into just this path of curiosity for me. That is um, really fascinating because uh, it also requires courage to pursue your curiosity. You know, um, a, a lot of people are drawn to certainty of saying, this is what I'm supposed to do. This yeah. is the path I'm going to take. I'm going to stick to that. Yeah. And you, your journey really is such a powerful expression of curiosity and courage of following your heart and your intellect. Yeah. And from culinary arts to spiritual psychology to top corporate jobs to investor mentor all kinds of things um take us back and tell us a little bit about your formation story okay well i mean i think it's interesting you talk you you talk about you know certainty and courage you know like i like i like being in uncertainty i like not knowing i like beginner mind i i prefer it and you know every job i've ever taken I've tried to come in and, you know, in the back of my mind, I, I think about what I already know, but I'm really showing up to try to see it again for the first time and, and bring something um, that refreshes the experience or, or, or br- brings a different perspective. And I think that comes out of the fact that um, I was uh, not a super great student. Uh, academically. I was okay. I mean, I had certain strengths and, and other significant stretches. And so I didn't come into my um, career thinking I knew everything. You know what I mean? I was not the smartest kid in the room. I was the most open and curious kid in the room. And I think that um, what this had me doing a lot of times earlier in my career is I would sit in meetings and listen <laughs> And I would have my own thoughts. And if I had one of my own thoughts early, early on, I would write it down. And if nobody had said it before the meeting wrapped up, I would put my hand up and I would say, I'm wondering about something. It wasn't mentioned. And I would say it. And people would be like, wow, you know, that's, that's amazing. We didn't think about that. And it wasn't that I was so much uh, like 
so bright or whatever, but my, my own sort of tendency to be almost rigorous and, and assuming I don't know the answer. So I'm constantly trying to disprove as well as prove whatever's going on. It's sort of a journalistic mindset mm-hmm. or the old version before fake news. Um, not that I believe in fake news, but like really good journalism seeks to disprove mm. um, as, a, as a means of getting to the bottom of things. And so um, I think that, I think that the courage came from that rigor, you know, it's like, I you get faith in the process almost. Yeah. The process will reveal the truth. Yes. And, and, you know, I, I think also, um, th- this is kind of a weird one, but I was the youngest by a lot in my family. And I'll, uh, there were a couple of times in my family history where I was being fed a load of horseshit because they didn't want me to know what was going on because it was too adult. And I knew what was going on. And I would be like, no, wait a minute. And that business of saying, no, wait a minute, is something that, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't become like a Debbie Downer of no, wait a minute in my business career, but I definitely cultivated the ability to say, can we just hold on for a second and go through this so that I understand it? And I could play, um, not dumb, but I could play like, I don't really see how the dots connect. Can you help me go through it? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's a, that is a very scary place to be in. <laughs> That's where it's courage. also vulnerable. It's, it's yeah. very vulnerable to put yourself. Yeah, and, and that vulnerability, I mean, I, I have no problem being taught at, at this stage. I mean, if somebody wants to teach me how to, how to process information better, bring it on. You mm-hmm. know, I'm, I'm very, very open about wanting to know more and wanting to learn from all different levels in an organization. Um, and so, I mean, I think that I think that, that that business of being in beginner's mind and of being rigorous around the, the, the data and information and also to some degree understanding the motives of different people within an organization and not judging them for it, but just understanding that that's a layer that's there mm-hmm. um, can help calm you down and go, oh yeah, he's worried about sales. That's mm-hmm. fine. That's mm-hmm. a quarterly cycle. Of course, he's saying X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And over here, they're worried about you know the 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 you know the rating of the company. That's okay. He's got his things to worry about. And over there, there's the risk radar person. That's okay. But you take all those things together and say, okay, as a marketer, especially, I'm in the business, and I'll probably say this over and over again. I'm the only department in the company that's in the business of the long range relationship with the customer. Mm -hmm. And so my job is to not buy in a hundred percent to sales or buy in a hundred percent to the rating or whatever. It's to say, okay, how can I be an advocate for people who buy the shit that we sell? Mm -hmm. How can I do the best job of that? Because if I do the best job of that, um, I I will help the company and help the stock price of the company and, you know, Mm -hmm. So what your, um, in some ways, your superpower is um, the ability to be true to yourself and listen um, with the goal of learning, you know, from a place of curiosity, but also have um, the level of EQ to be able to understand and empathize with others and really tapping into that. Um, yeah. that yeah. has uh, advanced and accelerated your career. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think that I actually know because um, one of the things I always do when I move on uh, from an organization is to go back to a couple of people and to get feedback. I, I'm constantly, constantly searching for feedback, even when most people would not be seeking it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the things that comes up over and over again is that, um, I am, I, I create provocative conversations without being provocative. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, um, it's funny because I, I sometimes have had to be colorful (laughs) in corporate environments, you know, like when I was at ESPN and I was, uh, you know, I'll I'll never forget. I was in a gigantic meeting of probably a hundred people in the biggest conference room that we had in Bristol, Connecticut. And it was a hockey preseason planning meeting. Everybody who was, you know, at the senior most level was together. 
and I was trying to say something <clears throat> that needed to be said. And it, I was in a room of dudes who were all talking loudly in dude voices. <laughs> and I had a pair of very pretty high heeled shoes and I took one of them off and I like Khrushchev started pounding or Brezhnev started pounding my shoe on the table because nobody was listening to me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, uh, they were like, and they laughed and I laughed because, you know, my relationship around the guys um, was always one of laugh first, but then have the tough conversation, mm -hmm. like bring humor with it because, you know, so much of it, so much of um, the stuff that guys get in trouble for is just stupidity. You know, never, never attribute to malice what stupidity can achieve without even trying kind of idea. And, um, you know, I always tried to give them an opportunity to correct mm -hmm. <laughs> when they were incorrect. Um, and so that, I think that that's why I got that reputation of, you know, pushing people towards provocative um, conversations and solutions without being personally uh, provocative. Mm, that's a yeah. powerful way to disrupt the patterns and, and drive yeah. home the most important yeah. things. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it's also reflecting. I mean, like I, if I think about my own internal process, which is probably useful for this conversation, I would sometimes, I, I would constantly be writing and almost journaling about my work, trying to figure out, what's going on, like writing something down in the heat of an emotional moment and then going back to it and saying, do I believe this? You know, like really having a dialogue with myself and coaching myself uh, along the way and occasionally synthesizing some of these internal conversations into conversations with other people, you know, and, and being able to um, create a, ref a reflective practice. I mean, I didn't call it that when I was doing it. It was frankly, my way of figuring out if I was expressing the idea that was inside of me clearly, because mm -hmm. there's so much of an opportunity in corporate life for misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, all those different interests that I described and their habits of thinking are it, entrenched in their habits of thinking and, and equally paranoid about being threatened. Mm -hmm. and, and so really trying to, to go around the houses and figure that out, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I, I mean, it sounds like a lot of work and it, it is on a certain level, but it isn't because it saved me so much um, misinterpretation, mm. you know, um, it made people in other departments who were challenged come to me for mentoring. I mean, which is a good thing and not a good thing because at a certain point you're like, basta, you know, enough already. I, <laughs> I have a job to do, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So how did you develop that practice? Because it sounds like such a powerful technique to not only constantly seek feedback, um, but listen and learn and document and introspect and be able to ask yourself powerful questions that allow you to self-coach and then, you know, find the common thread and see the patterns and synthesize yeah. that as key principles. Where did that you're making me sound like I just glided through my career <laughs> absolute perfection <laughs> fewer lines on my face with fewer gray hairs um, I think that for me uh, it was an inner practice it was I was always from a time I was a kid writing poetry so it was like an extension of a creative practice for me mm. um, and it was something that just uh, I just did it you know um, I also think it came from <clears throat> my mentor in my earlier life was my dad Dad, um, to a very large extent and <clears throat> I would have to speak to him long distance quite a bit and in those days long distance calling was expensive and so it would allow me to uh, distill you know the key message so get right into it and he was always he was always amazing you know he was always really really a great um, outside mentor for me um, sometimes what he would say would be so um, clear and sometimes what he would say would not be clear but then maybe a year later I would think about it and it would be informative 
Let's go through your career journeys. You know, you've uh, attained extremely high positions and very large scale companies with mm-hmm. tremendous responsibility and big decision making um, with risk and uh, visibility into everything you're doing. Yeah. First off, um, share a little bit about how you got started and what helped the advancement. And then we'll talk about, you know, what it was like being the only at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, when I was in college, I was uh, a sales rep at my college newspaper, and then I became like the equivalent of the student publisher of that newspaper. And it was, at the time, a paid daily circulation newspaper that had a readership of 30,000 people. And so it functioned like a real newspaper. And because I had that experience, and, and I managed a staff of 14 sales reps, um, I felt like I could convert that into a job, a real job. And um, I basically really went hard to get an interview with a New York advertising agency because that was my dream at that time. I, yeah. I had made a lot of ads through being the publisher of the newspaper because we had to find new ways to create revenue and we created all kinds of new products. We created a fashion tabular and a fitness tab and all these different things that allowed us to meet objections with a product that fulfilled against those mm-hmm. objections. Like, you know, the newspaper is not a good fashion environment. Oh, okay, we'll create this other thing. And then we sold a lot of advertising. And um, so I basically went in and just pushed and pushed and pushed to get an interview, which they didn't want to give me because they only talked to graduate students at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. But I wrote a note to the guy who was interviewing and I said, you know, I tried to get a coffee break with him and tried to bring him the best donuts in Bloomington. And they were like, no, no, no. And so I left him a note at the um, business placement office and said, I know I can't bribe you with donuts. So this is a basic humanitarian plea. This is what I've done. I would love to talk to you. I think I really could be an asset to um, your ad agency. (laughs) And he got a, he got a, five minute break and they called me in and I illegally parked my car and probably got, like I always say $200 worth of tickets. And I think that's not an exaggeration because I just like parked it in a, in a faculty spot and they dinged me bad. And I got the job. I I went to New York and I worked on Procter and Gamble business at gray advertising. And that was my launch. I mean, I was not, uh, I didn't have a high GPA. Uh, I had uh, all my roommates were like superstar finance majors with 4.2 GPAs. That was not me. And I was terrified, but I knew I had a skill, a set of skills that I could apply. And I was very fortunate to be um, launched into working on Proctor business because it was extremely structured. Mm. Um, and I learned that business. I learned the, the process that they use to write, the process that they use to establish budgets and pitch for budgets to Proctor. Um, and I went through that cycle. And it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing class of people. There were, it was international. It was, it was great. Um, but after about a year, I was like, I really don't like how uncreative this is. Um, and I kept pushing creative ideas, you know, like I would constantly be writing um, pitches for grants to women who wanted to go back to school, you know, like I was trying to advocate for the customer. Um, it was something, it's something that's always been in there for me. And, um, you know, there was a moment and I wanted to bring this up. It was, it was kind of in, in your, in your questionnaire, this, this idea that, um, you know, sometimes you're in a job and you're doing something because you have to learn it. You have to learn the process of how to do it, but it's not for you. You don't love it. And yeah. you look around at your colleagues and you go, wow, you know, Robert is so good at this and he seems to really like it. And I really don't like it. And you have a choice in that moment. You, you absolutely need to learn how to do it, whatever it is that you don't yeah. like doing. You have to master it. You must. That's the contract you have with your intellect and your, all the people who brought you up to this moment. But you also can look around and say, what do I really love? What do I really love doing? And then find it and go do it, you know? Um, you, you, you can choose to do that or you can choose to say, well, I'm bad and I'm a failure and this is not going to work. That bad failure not going to work conversation, I mean, you can choose to have it, but it doesn't give any energy to anything. 
Mm -hmm. And it's not serving anybody at all. And Mm -hmm. it's so important to stay as much as you possibly can in that energy space with yourself and to learn it. And you learn it over and over and over again. You go through periods of weakness where, you know, there, there are things coming forward that are telling you, you just don't get it or, you know, you're in the wrong field or whatever. You have to just kind of have that contract with yourself where you check in and you say, all right. And that's what happened to me on the Proctor business. I was like, I really want to be in a business that is less focused on crunching numbers. And and P.S., you know, I went in when I saw they were doing everything on calculators and brought in a spreadsheet and taught everybody how to use spreadsheets. (laughs) We can't hand crank these numbers. This is so stupid. You can press one button and it's done, you know. (laughs) Um, and that goes back to my curiosity. I don't think of myself as the most tech savvy person on earth, but when it's the practical use of technology to solve a problem, to speed something along that I don't want to do, I'm, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I stayed in that agency and I loved it and I worked on a lot of new business and I worked on Clairol, which was research and creative only. There was no, not, not a lot of number crunching. It was really understanding the customer and then translating the message uh, so that, you know, it would work in the marketplace and the culture of uh, both the professional side of Clairol and the direct to consumer uh, part. Um, but at that agency at the time, um, they really had a business model, and it's not their model now, but of giving clients what they wanted, not what they needed. And I hated that. Um, and I decided I was about 23 at the time to go someplace where they fired their clients. That was my idea in my head. And I got, I found an agency that had just let Club Med go. Club Med was their client and they had done this campaign called the Club Med Vacation, the Antidote to Civilization. And it was a huge success of a campaign and Club Med was growing by leaps and bounds, but they'd had some sort of creative difference and they fired them. I was like, that's where I want to go work. (laughs) And I got my wish because I got hired to work on Reebok. And the day I got there, they fired them. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I was very fortunate again because I got put on Four Seasons Hotels and Girl Spear. And Four Seasons had not become a resort business yet. And they had not done fractional ownership yet. And they had not done any of that stuff. And so I got to be a part of the beginning of that, which was really, really cool. And again, it was... um, much more of a sort of a consultative model of, of advertising, branding, marketing. Um, I stayed at that agency and I definitely hit a plateau like I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. Where I looked around and I thought, I love this place. I love my job, but I'm really not challenged. And so I went to cooking school. I found a place where I could go at night and I went and got a a certificate chef de cuisine at the French Culinary Institute, which is now called the Institute of Culinary Education. And um, I worked at restaurants while I worked in the agency, like a crazy person. But for me, it was um, fun. I just loved it. I food was, is sort of in that, in that field of of art for me and a a source of creativity. And um, I got like after a year of doing that, I got promoted, you know, I got more on my plate. And so I became more engaged in it again. Mm -hmm. And then after another year, I plateaued again. And it was an agency that did not have a lot of clients. They believed in building their clients' businesses and growing that way. So the senior layer, the senior most layer was populated. And there were three of us who were like um, senior VP, management supervisor, managing director kind of people that weren't going to be able to move any any further at that place Mm -hmm. and so um i decided to start my own company and i started a radio production Mm -hmm. company with a partner um and we you know just were off to the races that i was about 30 at that point and um you've accomplished all of this stuff (laughs) by the age of 30 I mean, it's, it, it's funny. It's just, I was just doing it. You know, I was just learning for me. It, it was always about a learning curve and it still is about a learning curve. It's really yeah. interesting for somebody who is not super rewarded by academic endeavors as a young person. I was very much like I grew up in a very rich household, you know, lots of interesting people coming in and out and Self, self-teaching self is just a part of life, you know, and so um, 
I think that that's, that's how it happened. I just kind of bopped from one thing to the next, but the thread was always the learning curve, mm -hmm. selfishly. That's amazing. Well, um, so you've switched lanes many times. You've gone from one type of role, one type of industry to different types of responsibilities. And then also, you know, launching your own business, which is in itself uh, quite a challenge. And most people that have, that are great at their jobs are not often as confident about giving that up and the security and certainty of that to go off on your own. Um, right. Right. That as well. Um, what has allowed you to overcome any fears or uh, doubt about whether you can, whether you should um, right. to yeah. go through that? Well, I, I think that when, <clears throat> whenever something comes into our consciousness that um, invites us to take a risk, it's there for a reason. <laughs> yeah. it's coming to us as a gift for us to figure out what we're going to do with it. And, you know, when my kids were small, I have a, a 18 year old and a 16 year old, both boys. I, cause I can't get away from men in all aspects of my career and my life. I have two male cats. <laughs> anyway. Um, I used to say to my kids, being brave is being scared and doing it anyway, which is, you know, the definition of bravery to me is just being afraid, but doing it anyway. And so when you combine that with this idea that um, you see an opportunity, that consciousness has been given to you because of your collective experiences and your own separate inner knowing and, and the way that you look at the world, um, it's an obligation if that idea doesn't go away you know, doesn't fade in, in your interest to, to, to pursue it. It's like, it's inviting you to co-create in the world, you know? And, and I think that that is a power, has always been a powerful thought for me. Um, I will say though, that when I started the radio company, it, it was really driven by my friend, David, who I started it with saying, you have to do this thing. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many different ways we are invited to mm -hmm. step into potential for ourselves. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's a little whisper of an idea that we have within ourselves. Sometimes it's a person coming forward to say, come on, let's do this thing. Um, and you have to really look at both of those circumstances and say, wow, lucky me. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with this? And also I think inside of the fear space, you have sometimes this conversation with yourself um, where it's all about fear and it could to some tr degree be about love and trust. Mm -hmm. Like if I decide to set aside my fear, to recognize it, to acknowledge it and say, Hey buddy, hi, you know, I think you're really important. My fear is, is actually valuable to me. I can use my fear, but right now I don't want my fear driving the seven passenger van mm -hmm. and I want to take it and invite it to sit in the back row and maybe fall asleep for a little bit what would the other aspect of my consciousness talk to me about, about the, the, the trust? How can I trust this idea? Mm -hmm. How can I trust that all the things I fear around this idea may be more minimal than I perceive them to be right now? Mm -hmm. And then um, what, would, what, would, what would happen if I just stepped into it? And it's an imagination exercise. And you really, I mean, the imagination is an underutilized tool in business people sometimes. Why? And I think that I think that um, if we if we use our imagination, we can certainly come up with the Frankenstein monster version, and that's fine. And far too many people are capable of that. And I I think that that's the province of small minds sometimes. But if you can use your imagination to come up with what might might be possible, think about what it would be like not to do that thing. Mm. That feel. And then you have the other side, right? You have almost like this, this, this kind of scale that comes into place, you know, because mm -hmm. you go, oh, wow, what if, what if I didn't do that? How would I feel if I didn't do that? Mm -hmm. What story would I tell to all the people who I might maybe whispered a little bit of, of this idea to, which is P.S. a reason not to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> do it. But there's that, you know? And so for me, I think a lot of times I was, I was in that space, um, when I was making my risk taking decisions and I definitely in meetings with collaborative decision making around risk was in that space. Uh, you know, 
what your uh, illustration is so powerful when you describe the idea of, you know, fear being a backseat passenger in a minivan. I mean, that's a very powerful visualization to say, you don't have to put fear in the driver's seat. No. You get to choose where you want to place your fear. Use it to your advantage when it's necessary, but you get to, you know, you're, you got to stay the driver and both fear and, um, you know, failure, loss, any number of those things can be elements of, you know, emotions that you tap into of where you decide to place them. In terms of you being in a senior position as CMO of, a, you know, major organizations, uh, what was that experience like for you to, you know, what helped you get to that senior position for one thing, and then what helped you sort of excel and yeah. demonstrate success? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that I think that um, probably my career was enhanced by the fact that I started on a kind of a business path, an account executive, strategic planning path, and then I completely departed it and became a creative. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because the radio production company was, um, to some degree, writing, but it was directing and casting and producing mm-hmm. a creative product. Um, and then, and, and doing it at, at a high volume of work, like a ton of work, just like a fire hose coming at you and being able to handle that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then when I went to get that big, big job, which was the ESPN job, which was a leap because I'd been in advertising and, you know, radio production was partially advertising was partially like what you would call content nowadays, like radio plays and, and, you know, little short form entertainment. Mm -hmm. Um, When I went over to cable television, which was what ESPN was considered back then. And we grew it into something much bigger. um, I could handle the volume of the work and I could, deliver a high quality creative product over and over again, or I could oversee the process. Um, I also knew how to get work done by getting other people doing that work Mm. and translating the vision into other people doing that work because it is impossible to do it all yourself. Mm. And I actually, I hate talking about the work I did at ESPN because people are like, you did blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, not really. I made sure that the best creative ideas were protected from being killed by the corporate machine that will kill those ideas. You know, I, I have always said that, um, you know, the best creative ideas in, in advertising, especially, are like a, a, a baby chick on Easter Sunday morning. If too many people handle that baby chick, it will be dead by noon, I promise you. <laughs> so the creative idea cannot be messed with too much. It can't be touched too much. It can't be altered too much. It can't be manipulated and handled too much. Because once you have a strategy and you have a creative idea that helps you to achieve that strategy creatively in a way that your executive team can't do, because your executive team is in sales and in risk and in whatever, you know, strategy, product development, those people are not there yeah. To do that creative expression of your business out in the world, that's not their job. So, um, you know, so let's Thompson- dig into um, creating strong teams because yeah. okay. without that leverage, as you pointed out, you know, nobody accomplishes or becomes successful alone. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. always about great teams, um, but that is a skill to be able to know what constitutes a great team. It's not just get a whole bunch of Ivy League you know, graduates with 4.0 GPAs, there's the chemistry, there's the passion and uh, the communication, all of those elements. What's your formula playbook, if you will, that has worked for you from your perspective and developing, identifying the talent, developing those teams, and then creating the right environment for them to flourish? Right. Well, I have been in a circumstance where I had to build a team. Um, I've been in a circumstance where a portion of it, a very big portion of a team was thrust upon me because of a merger. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have built my own teams. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that in marketing, especially when you think about it, you have on the team, everything from a data scientist to a writer to a Mm -hmm. filmmaker, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, and in some instances you have a channel marketer who's sort of a quasi salesperson. Right. Um, 
And so one of the most important things is to help all of them understand how they contribute to the overall delivery mm -hmm. of the, the service to the company, right? And so that requires that once a year you sit down and you look at the work that everybody's done and you help everybody understand how to access insight from the data person to the writer um, uh, to the, 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 the filmmaker and helping them to understand the pain points of the organization so that they're in that problem solving mode. I think that at ESPN, we definitely went through some periods of time where we were not solving a problem for the ESPN to consumer equation. We were solving a problem for, you know, Congress wants to institute a la carte pricing and cable, and we have to come up with a way to talk about it to our cable customers mm -hmm. so that they, uh, write a letter saying, please don't do all cart pricing. I mean, this is a million years ago now because now everything's, you know, cord cutting has happened. Everything that we worried about, you know, with all la carte pricing has come to, to fruition. Um, and all the good stuff too. Um, so I think that ha having teams that understand the value of each member of the team and the organization so that when it comes time to hand bonuses, you know, having fighting around that because, a lot of it comes down to that. It really does. And so they need to understand how each individual member of the marketing team contributes, right? And they need to also understand the outside company's pain points so that they can be filtering that. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, I think that you are going to have circumstances, as I did at Thomson Reuters, where you have a member of the team, and actually at ESPN2, a member of the team that thinks they should have your job. Mm -hmm. They don't really want your job. They just want to make you like roast you over the coals because they think you should, they should have your job. Mm -hmm. And you have to just cultivate an extremely candid conversation with them about that to mm -hmm. say, listen, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's not the reality here. We have to work together and it's not a good look on you when you're being difficult with me. And, you know, again, it goes back to that sort of having, having the tough conversations mm -hmm. in a timely way. Mm. so that you can keep your cool and not be aggravated all the time. Cause it's aggravating to have somebody who uh, is supposed to be an adult behaving like a child. And there's another piece of it that really is about management at any level. If you're like uh, at an ad agency and you've just been made into an account executive and you've been given an assistant account executive as I was when I first got promoted and my assistant account executive, I was 22, he was 30 and he had just, quit the law to become an advertising man. Mm -hmm. And I had a 30 year old man. I mean, like a 30 year old man might as well have been like, you know, my grandpa mm -hmm. that was reporting to me. And he was a guy who was brilliant, but he was a complainer and he was working in a cubicle and all day long complaining. And people were like, you know, this guy, he complains all the time. Is he good? Do you like him? Do you want to fire him? <laughs> I was like, no, he's good at his job. And so, I, again, I had to pull him into my office and shut the door, and I said to him, listen, um, you're doing a great job, and, and you're going to, like, eclipse me in three months, but you need to understand that you're out there kvetching about everything. Mm -hmm. People think you're not a hard worker. So, like, cut it out. Just don't. It's not, you're not doing yourself any good. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh my God, I do, I do. I know I do that. I'm a complainer. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, if you want to complain, you can come in here and complain. Don't complain so much because I don't want to hear it either. But like, if you need to blow off steam, come here, close the door, blow off steam, get it out of your system and then go back out there. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to kind of be on the side of the people who are working for you and understand them with compassion. You know, mm -hmm. you also need to understand what's bringing them to work. Some people work just for the money. Some people work in, in marketing, especially to build their portfolio you know, and to be creative. Um, some people work because of the fellowship of the group and being in, a, in the field of a group of creative people. So know that and understand the individuals because management is understanding individuals. Yeah, I mean, you, you, if every person is unique, then there yeah. is no one size fits all. Yeah, there's not. To that. There's not. Um, but finding a way that connects and um, brings people together to a common yeah. cause. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I definitely, I definitely exercise. I, I did that Harvard uh, class in dealing with difficult people in difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And I would say the merger of Thomson Reuters and my staffing situation 
was one extremely difficult person in an extremely difficult situation. And um, it was something that I learned a ton from. Mm -hmm. I, I hope to never repeat it, but I learned a lot from it. Now, um, having huge responsibilities and managing large teams and large pieces of business, um, especially with really visible brands, um, there's a lot to do with strategy, but it's even more about effective execution. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's about effective execution that gets the results for public companies that are being held to a very high standard and all of that. Um, What has... um, helped you drive execution it's not about what you do personally but getting other people to do it and and do it right and do it on time and all of that what are some sort of guiding principles that you have over the years sort of um established as the keys um to execution yeah well i think that um you need to at the start of any process share a vision and use examples like literal examples to help people understand what you're driving for Mm-hmm. People on your team who you have to get to execute, you know, across the board. Um, I think that when you comment on work that comes back to you, as it inevitably does when you're in a in an approval position or a funding position, mm-hmm. as I, you know, I, anything that anything that cost a, over two hundred thousand dollars to do, I absolutely had to be involved with, and I, I had a policy of anything uh, over five thousand five hundred dollars, just because we didn't have that much resource and you can have the death of a thousand pokes with that. Um, but when you give feedback, give it as specifically as you possibly can so that the individual has something to work with. Um, and actually that goes back to my, um, my advertising days because I had a client who would demand that he got three concepts for every every print initiative he wanted three separate concepts to be presented to him Mm -hmm. and and yet he was like rejecting everything and I came onto the business and he had done around and rejected it all and my creative team was extremely demoralized and I went to him the client and I said listen I have no problem giving you three executions but you need to give me three discrete reasons why you're not buying each execution so that I have something to take back to my creative teams to help guide them. Um, Because whether you understand it or not, there is a morale quotient that is not a money quotient. It's just a spirit quotient that I need to preserve. It's like a bank account that I have. And if I go back and just say he doesn't like it, that's not good enough. They have nothing they can do with he doesn't like it. And he was a a Jesuit trained intellectual and he was like, Okay. And he did it. And so I think the same thing is true is when you're managing process, you need to really be specific, Mm -hmm. give specific direction, and that allows the vision to come into reality and it gives morale to the people who are carrying it forward. Mm -hmm. And it also gives them the ability to solve for the comment that you make as opposed to having you solve for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to the growth of individual um, leaders who you're leading And I think that it is um, also gives a spirit to the group and makes them feel like they're growing. And I think growth is really important um, at every stage of of a career. Now, um, you know, in addition to running large portions of business and also being in these senior roles, the assumption one might make is, you know, corporate leaders of at that status and stature are perhaps uh, very buttoned up and not vulnerable or not willing to lead with emotion or show them um, as a sign of weakness, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of break that rule, <laughs> you know, yeah. in terms of being not only very uh, comfortable with being emotional, um, but very authentic in how you express that. Yeah. How do you reconcile that? And how did you reconcile that in the workplace specifically? Oh, I mean, I think it's like an ongoing process. Um, but I, at some point I realized, and probably ESPN was a great place for me to realize this, that that quality um, made me buy better work, that quality of emotionality. 
mm-hmm. the ability to you understand found that um, part of you and in, in yeah terms- that part of me that part of me had me picking things mm-hmm. that felt very scary sometimes to the other leadership on, around the executive committee table, but that were ultimately absolutely the right thing mm-hmm. to create the relationship with the fan. You know what I mean? And yeah. I think that it was solidified there. I think I had a couple of experiences earlier where that emotional quotient came through. Um, but I think that knowing that the, the, the unfair advantage in a way was great creative work that taps into that emotional mm-hmm. um, mine uh, was something that helped me to really do a better job of picking work mm. and uh, proper, you know, acknowledgement to George Bodenheimer who ran ESPN at the time. He let good work happen. Mm. You know what I mean? I, if I was going to write a book ever, I think I would write a book called letting good work happen yeah. um, because it's very important to um, be scared and do it anyway, be brave and and none of that would be possible without tapping into emotion and empathy and oh, compassion and yeah. bringing it all together to yeah. know how to do yeah. that. And that's particularly important not to lose, especially as we're moving more and more into a, you know a true sort of digital age where you know the um, a world that will be driven by artificial intelligence and automation and all of that. How do you not lose inherent the innate human skills and yeah. the ability to connect, um, the ability to create, and uh, the ability to communicate? Yeah. Um, sure. So when you look into the future, you know, ten years, twenty years out, like what what do you hope stays the same, and what are you excited to see evolve? Well, I'm really excited to see the ingrained attitudes of racism evolve. If I really do hope that that is on its way to happening. I really do. Um, and uh, I mean, in, in terms of things that I hope stay the same, it's kind of weird. I mean, I, I look at all of media. You know, when you say digital, I think media, right? I'm, I'm thinking about media. Um Digital is so far a fairly low resolution medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, a book is an extremely high resolution. I have tons of books back here. I'm a big book lover. I hope that we maintain high resolution and and digital. I hope we maintain both. Um, and the reason I hope we maintain both is the same reason why I hope my children at some point learn how to cursive write. They did never got taught it in school, um, and it's 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 terrible because. To me, the, the kinesthetic kind of action of writing with the pencil to get my flow going, to get my ideas out is valuable. And so I, 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 one thing I hope remains the same is that we continue to use the various, you know, like I hope that I can always use a paintbrush to paint. I, I love, I mean, believe me, I love being able to photograph something I'm working on and then go into a digital platform and mess with it and try on different colors and all that kind of stuff. But um, I hope that we keep those human artifacts because mm. I think they have their own purpose for us. Um, I, I hope we evolve completely beyond the racist reality of the United States of America because I honestly think that over history we've seen that when the United States embraces diversity, whether it was embracing Jewish refugees from World War II and the Nazis and all that, we get something amazing back from embracing that. Mm -hmm. And the amazing thing we get back sometimes manifests as a competitive advantage or a financial advantage. And I really, really worry about that right now. I, I have friends who are are from Berlin who've lived here for five years, they move back. They don't feel safe here, you know, and uh, it just makes me sad. And, and that is writ large over and over again in the, in the experience of black and brown mm-hmm. and indigenous people in the United States. And it's, it's just wrong and we've got to fix it. So I really, really hope, I mean, like those are the two things I would say. And I, I'm sorry they're not as connected to some digital future. Um, yeah, I, but, I, but it's, it's about change. You know, they're connected yeah. to change yeah. and what is important to hold on to of yeah. 
you know, our connection with our humanity, but also letting go of the things that we fear as humans, which is difference. And um, being able to shed that and, and change is always painful. Um, so, you know, we're experiencing that pain right now in our society. Yeah. And yeah. But, um, that pain often creates the space for something beautiful to emerge from that. Yeah. Um, so you know, what would um, your guidance be to uh, women that are earlier in their career that are ambitious, have the talent, have the drive, they look at you and they want to, you know, achieve the kind of successes you have. Um, what guidance would you give? And then also what self-care advice would you give? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is learn the business. If you're lucky enough to have a a job and a role in a business, learn that business as deeply as you can, but don't lose yourself in that process, Mm -hmm. you know, bring yourself to that process for real. And don't, don't be afraid to do that in quirky ways. I think it's more allowed than it used to be. I mean, I think a lot of people looked at me like I was some sort of a, you know, weird beast back in the day. Um, but, but also, and I've said this to somebody recently, if an opportunity is coming your way and it's in the field that you want to pursue, but it's not the subject matter that you think you're going to be interested in, be with what's coming towards you and really try it out. You know, nowadays you have this opportunity to not be dinged for, for doing it for a year and then going on to do something yes. else. Because yeah. in my era, you know, I was, I, I had articles written about me because the, the normal tenure of a CMO was 23 months back in those days. And I had been a CMO for, I don't know, eight years or something at ESPN and then five years at Thomson Reuters. And that was like unheard of in those, in those days because everything had changed so much. People were like cycling through in 23 months. But try things on and don't forget to bring your whole self to them. You know, your separate self, who you are. Right. Because conforming, I mean, conforming to understanding the business is one thing, but you as a human being need to bring your separate self. It's so important because that's the only way you'll figure out who you want to become inside the context of business, mm. I think. That is beautiful. That's beautifully said. And yeah. what self-care practice has helped you through the years as um, a, a top executive, as a mom, as um, someone with very personal and intellectual interests? Yeah, I think that um, it would go back to feeding my head. I'm constantly feeding my head. I'm reading books. I'm out in nature. I go to museums. I have a lot of friends who are artists and architects and photographers. And I I try to kind of blend um, the experience of my friends who are doing other things into my own experience. It's all about the curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. And um, on a, on a just more business sort of survival level, I read two publications um, and I still read them. I do them digitally too, but I read The Economist. Mm -hmm because I find that it's less hype driven um, from a news perspective. And for those of you out there who can't afford The Economist, you can go to your local library and read it for the most part. Um, And something called The Sun, which is, um, (laughs) it's a literary magazine and it's a little bit, it's a little bit like on the verge of being a socialist um, magazine. It's not a socialist magazine, but it's like, it definitely will take, um, learned articles from academia and bring it down to earth for regular people, you know, mm-hmm. and they'll do articles, for example, on um, the black farming movement. So mm-hmm. I'll get to learn about black farmers, right. you know, and, and do a Q and a read a Q and a with the woman who's running that movement or who created that movement. And I need that. I need to understand all the little fringes and pieces in order to sort of tie it all together to understand culture before it becomes big, you know, capital C culture. Um, And there's a risk to that, though, because the risk of knowing those things and saying those things out loud in corporate boardrooms, some people really just don't get it. And I was saying this to you earlier, there's a line from a song that really really drives me. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, the, the band is called Concrete Blonde, and the song was called True. And the line is, if I had the choice... I take the voice I've got, but it was hard to find. Mm, that's a beautiful line. Yeah. 
And, you know, I get choked up when I talk about it because I think about, you know, 28 year old me in a conference room as a VP trying to sell in something that nobody understands. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, it's someplace else. Somebody's done it because Mm -hmm. somebody understood. And, you know, I obviously haven't processed the pain of being that person in that moment. And I probably should go back and talk to that person a little bit. But I want to say to anybody who is that person in your audience, whether they're 28 or 38 or 48 or 68 for that matter, because, you know, um, I think people are working longer and women especially and and black people and people of color and indigenous people are trying to fit in to the the system that exists that is, you know, trying to do better, but isn't there yet Um, that you have to use the voice you've got because it was hard to find. You Mm -hmm. have to use it. Um, You have to recognize when you're not being heard and maybe cool it for a little bit and then come back to, to fight another day. But it's really important. It's really important. That's um, tremendous uh, advice. <laughs> Just the kind of wisdom that is needed for this day and age. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think your journey is so filled with curiosity and courage. I'm going to keep coming back to that. It's just fascinating how you've evolved through your own life and your career, just simply having faith in that part of you and the conviction Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. find your voice, to express it and to create the path for others to follow. So thank you so much for being on this podcast. And uh, also looking forward to hearing your podcast, say it forward podcast and, you know, the upcoming season. So we'll be following you on that. Um, And say it forward podcast is already up. So if anybody wants to go listen to it, you can go to iTunes and, and Listen to the do. Mike Metavoy episode. He's a fascinating man. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Leanne. Okay. Take care. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.